Hey everybody, welcome back to my Zero Carb Life. I'm Kelly Hogan and today I have Dr. Anthony Chafee coming on the show. He has 10 years of actual carnivore experience. Now I have had seven other 10 year carnivores on the show. That's Charles Washington, Dana Spencer, Dr. Lisa Wiedemann, Amber O'Hearn, Jennifer Lechner, Amanda Radke, Terry Rogers, and now Dr. Anthony Chafee. So everybody who comes on the show with any carnivore experience has something to say, but when they have done it successfully for 10 years, and also when they look like this guy, and when they are an official MD who has worked with patients nonstop for the past 20 years, that's the dream. He's a functional medical practitioner, and he is also a neurosurgical resident. He's done everything from work in refugee camps in Bangladesh to working with professional athletes. He himself is a rugby player and has lots of experience with how to actually improve himself as an athlete on the carnivore diet. He has been on pretty much any and all carnivore podcasts recently telling his story. So if you want to hear his story, I'm going to link to some others that have shared that. But I would really like to go past his story and to get to some questions that I still had even after hearing him on other episodes. So let's get started. Welcome, Dr. Anthony Chapey. Hey. Hey, man. How's it going? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. You've been on everything lately. Everything. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah, I was just, uh, yeah, I got a little more active with it. Like, you know, I started four years ago with with Dr. Baker on his original uh, Human Performance Outliers podcast. Yeah. But I never really had my own platform. Right. And just sort of last few months, I just decided to get that going. But you've yeah. been consistently, well, let me say your time added up together as yeah. Total Carnivore. You've got like 10 years under your belt, correct? Yeah, yeah. So when you hear people say that you can't do this therapeutic carnivore elimination diet for the long term on a scale of one to 10, how stupid does that sound to you? It, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, um, yeah. I mean, you're not really, you know, thinking past the surface, right? Because yeah. obviously we can think of countless examples right now yes. of people are doing that, just the Inuits, right? You know, people, people talk about different, different native populations and tribes and, you know, heretofore known as carnivores and apex predators and all these sorts of things, but they say, oh, well, I'm sure they eat plants. And you'll have some anthropologists right. you know, write some phony book about all the different plants and how they cook them and how they eat them, but they don't actually tell you that they almost never do that. You have spent a lot of time, not just researching carnivore, not just working with hundreds of patients, but I, I've also heard that you have spent a good bit of time doing deep dives into like plant-based world vegan world like to find out okay why do they say these things is there validity to it and i like that may i ask how old you are i'm 43 42 so i just turned 42 in january i just turned 43 in january cool 42 is actually my favorite number so i really tell people i'm 42 plus one i love 42 my favorite numbers too i don't know why. oh my gosh that's why i didn't even know the connection between the hitchhiker's guide the galaxy and the number 42 until Mm -hmm. years after it had already been my favorite number and then i was like well there you go i don't know what that means but it feels special it's answered everything everything man i wish i was still 42 all right (laughs) after all of your research and your time living this way and your time working with patients do you have any reason to believe that you or I, or anyone else should add carbs back, should add, not that they can, but they should mm-hmm. add carbs back after they experience this healing that we have, that we felt. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think carbohydrates get any benefit, uh, except in, in times of starvation. Like if you're, if you're dying and that's what, and that's what you're going to need to eat to survive so you can yes. move on then you're know, sure or whatever. But on a day-to-day basis, no, it doesn't give any, any benefit that I can see. You have a family, I assume, um, parents, maybe siblings, aunts, uncles. Would you have any hesitancy about your own family doing the carnivore diet? No, no. And in fact, um, I, I didn't want to push it on anyone, but at the same time, I was very, very happy when, when a few of them started picking it up, my parents picked it up first cool. and I was very happy about that. My parents have been doing it for four years. My brother's been oh my doing gosh. it for three and a half, three years and, and they're all doing great. And so, no, I, I highly encourage it and I, I don't push it on anybody, but I, I really do like it when they 
when they go on it, because I, I know it provides so much benefit and I've seen it provide so much benefit for my parents specifically. My mom was a type two diabetic for 25 years. She was on three different oral medications, was on a high dose of insulin. She was now insulin dependent. Two months on a high fat carnivore diet, she came off all of her oral medications, reduced her insulin down to the minimal dose. And her HbA1c went from 8.9, which is quite high, down to 6.1, which is you know high normal for a non-diabetic. And, and her doctor was just amazed at this and said, you know, how did you do this? You know, diabetes is a progressive disease. It only gets worse. People don't reverse this, but she did. And, you know, I see this in my patients as well. I see this all, all over the place. Everybody I've ever told about this who has tried it reverses their diabetes, you know, and, and, and type two diabetes anyway, and, and significantly improves their control on their type one diabetes down to the to point where they only have a very minimal dose of their background insulin, and they don't need to take any fast acting insulin throughout the day. My father had, uh, was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Oh. He was having, um, you know, some serious issues with his memory and he was just slowing down. He'd had a couple of hospitalizations and he was just really, really finding it hard to recover from these things. Again, two months on a high fat carnivore diet. It was just, he was like his old self again. You know, he was, he was there again. He was going through his old PhD physics and mathematics, you know, textbooks from when he was at Berkeley and, you know, doing all sorts of, you know, he started teaching himself Greek, ancient Greek. So he could, you know, uh, read, and, you know, the, the man's 81 now turning 82. That's yeah. amazing. Look, when a man like you, who has literally your entire adult life studied medicine, people studies, all various kinds of diets and how they affect humans. When you say that the people you love most, you are mm -hmm. happy for them to eat this way. Like that says volumes to me, you know, yeah. that's, you, you love these people. You want the best for them. Yeah. I'm so happy for you and for them. That's cool. Would you yeah. hesitate um, someone starting a carnivore diet if either cancer, heart disease, or thyroid? I hear these three concerns the most. Cancer, yeah. heart disease, and thyroid. If you had a patient and like, let's say one of those things or all three rampant in their family, would you yeah. be like, man, I don't know, maybe not carnivore. I, I would absolutely recommend it, especially for those things. There are, there are tons of studies that show that eliminating uh, carbohydrates from your diet, glucose from your diet and so forth, increasing fat. Uh, has a significant benefit in fighting and preventing cancer. I have many patients that have had thyroid issues. Their thyroid issues have by and large corrected and some things like autoimmune disorders, such as Hashimoto's. Again, you know, that that's uh, largely reversed heart disease as well. I just did a debate with the Australian college of nutrition and environmental medicine on, on cholesterol. And, you know, did we get it right? Does it actually cause heart disease? And it was a resounding, no, it was never a problem in the first place. All the data and all the studies that claimed cholesterol was a marker of disease and, and heart disease were fraudulent. They were made up. They were false. You know, they were bought and paid for by the sugar companies. We have hard evidence of this, you know, um, you know, the journal of American medical association published in 2015, actual internal memos from the sugar companies um, detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol is causing heart disease when it was really sugar and to then exonerate sugar and call it an empty calorie. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And then it was he who helped author and publish the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol causes heart disease and saturated fat increases cholesterol. Stop eating both. So there, this was hotly debated for decades before that. You know, I, I found a, a you know, JAMA article, Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA article in 1956 from a, you know, uh, a very prominent professor at the time saying, I, yeah, I know we were sort of accepting that you know, uh, cholesterol uh, causes heart disease, but this is all based on really bad science or really bad data. Yeah. These are bad studies and here's why. And he just went through and just tore these things apart in 1956. And in, you know, in the 1970s, there was, you know, um, Dr. Yudkin, who's a, a British doctor. He wrote a book called, I think like, uh, you know, Sweet White Deadly or something like that. And, and it was all about how sugar was toxic and was likely the cause of heart disease. All of these guys got discredited. As soon as the USDA weighed in and said, nope, that's it, case closed, everyone's just like, bam, that's it. You know, as soon as teacher said, you know, then obviously teacher's right. Well, this is a logical fallacy. This is appealing to authority. You know, just because, you know, someone in charge said it's correct doesn't mean it's correct. All of those things, I think, are, are very important for people to go onto a high-fat 
uh, carnivore diet or at least a ketogenic diet and removing things like lectins and so forth and and also and you know nightshades and, and all these sorts of things but really the best way to do it is, is eliminating all plant material right? and fungus obviously um I, I lump those together but you know that that's the main thing when i talk to people when i say you know eating carnivore it's not just eating more meat which is obviously very beneficial this is this is your optimal nutrition source but the trick is not eating all the other things because the other things cause harm it's not that they're just not as good it's that they are bad yeah. you know it's not that you you don't need to eat the salad to get the nutrition you need it's that you do not want to eat the salad the salad is bad for you yeah. and so as any as any three-year-old can tell you the stuff is bad you know? <laughs> yes yeah i've got three little kids myself none of them would beg for broccoli none yeah. of them. And I was, well, they got real lucky with me. They hit jackpot because I would never made them eat broccoli. I was carnivore yeah. long yeah. before I had my first kid. So I never yeah. pushed broccoli on them. Okay. So when it comes to cholesterol, I assume that you're on board with most people in the carnivore space. What we want to see is high HDL, low triglycerides. Does that matter yeah. to you? Is that the main thing you look for in cholesterol? Yeah, yeah, it is. And, you know, but when, when someone is actually carnivore, you know, like myself, like I, I, I don't really care what yeah. my cholesterol is because whatever it is, it's, it's optimal Yes, because it's, or at least physiological because I'm eating physiologically, I'm eating to a biologically species specific way. And so whatever my, you know, biochemical markers are doing, I know that the, that's what my body wants them to do. So I don't need to micromanage these things because I, I don't have a, a disease or a genetic disorder. You know, some people yeah. may, and they need, may need to check it out. If you're eating the wrong thing, yeah, sure. You do need to check that out. But you know, like, as exactly as you say, if you have high HDL and low triglycerides, whatever your LDL is, it's fine because yeah. those LDL are good LDL. All you need to test for is like you say, HDL yeah. triglycerides. And if you have a high, LDL, high HDL and low triglycerides, you know, by and large, your, your LDL is going to be fine. The way we get our reference ranges for our blood values and so forth in various areas is basically, you know, every year, every cycle, the first 2000 people that come in and get that blood test, that's your reference range. We're just calling that the normal sort of reference range. It's like, okay, well, a lot of people that get blood tests aren't well, no. you know, these are sick people, elderly people, people that are having problems, people that are on medications. Um, so that's not really indicative of health. You know, when I, I do, uh, you know, I'm in, in, um, you know, uh, specializing in neurosurgery, but I also have a, you know, side practice in functional medicine, preventative care and bariatric medicines. So we're helping people lose weight, get healthy and stay healthy and, and not have to use a bunch of medications. And that's one of the things that we do is we actually use different reference, reference ranges. We use reference ranges, uh, for healthy young adults, basically healthy people in their mid twenties that don't have issues that aren't on medication. And so you, you find there's a very different range. And, you know, there was a study in the States uh, with 140,000 people in America who had had a heart attack. And they found that 50% of them had low LDL cholesterol, supposedly low LDL cholesterol, 50% of them had high. So there isn't, it's not even a correlation. There isn't even a slight increase, 140,000 people. Uh, furthermore, they followed these people up for two years and the people that, you know, kept low cholesterol, they had two times the mortality rate after the fact. So they were dying off even after the, even if the, the heart attack didn't kill them at twice the rate. Now we know people over the age of 60, yes. higher cholesterol, longer life, uh, life expectancy, longevity, they have better, they have better health, they have better uh, biomarkers, they have lower rates of different sorts of diseases and so forth, the lower rates of dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So, you know, yeah, we, we had a big sort of, uh, you know, blowout in, in this debate and, but it, you know, it was, it was sort of three very well-regarded and, and some world famous cardiologists. And then, you know, me for some reason, right? So just because I made enough noise about cholesterol and how we just really got this wrong, that you know they they asked me to be on the panel, which was you know very very flattering. Uh, but there's some of these guys were were absolutely world famous uh, doctors. You know, one guy that was on my team was you know um, Asim Mahotra. He was a physician to the Queen of England, and uh, you know uh, and wrote a book called A Statin Free Life. And you know he's like say he's been saying this for years. Like this is not the way to go, guys. And you got this wrong. And the studies are there, the data is there, and and it's just it's just a matter of time before enough people actually, you know, read this stuff and, and are able to get over the dogma 
of, of the last 50 years of saying that cholesterol is going to cause heart disease and kill you. When it was my 11 year carnivore anniversary, I went for blood work and that particular time, not always, but my LDL was slightly over 100. Mm -hmm. And my very not well looking doctor at the time <laughs> said, uh, I would like to talk to you about a statin. And I was like, you cannot be serious. And I said, uh, I'll do this. I'll go get a CAC scan. If yeah. it's zero, we won't have to talk about a statin, right? And she yeah. was like, I get, she almost seemed like I, uh, uh, like I've never thought of that before. Yeah. Mm. So of course it was zero. I said, it's been 11 years. If I'm at a zero, why wouldn't you check that first? I feel like that's so crazy. Yeah. Um, here's a little bit of a hot topic. Fasting. I mm. was, I had no idea until recently how you felt about fasting, but I heard yeah. you say the exact same thing that Charles Washington said a, a decade ago, except that he just like felt it in his soul from living this way. <laughs> And you had a lot of research to back it up. So what he has always said, Charles Washington is a 14 year carnivore who yeah. he was the first, he was my mentor. Have mm. you heard of Charles Washington? I, yeah, I have. Oh, no, okay. I, I, okay. I, yeah, cool. chat room a bit briefly on Facebook and things like that. You know, he's a good guy. He yeah. is. He's a great guy. So he used to always say, you know, fasting is fantastic if you're eating carbs because yeah. good for you, your body is going to get a break from carbs. It's yeah. the best thing you can do if you're not going to go carnivore is fast because your body is just getting fewer carbs. But he said, if you are eating what you call a fasting mimicking diet, mm -hmm. and he never described it quite that way. He would just say a diet, you know, that replicates the benefits of fasting. He's like, then you can actually eat, not go around hungry, get the benefits of having nutrients, but yeah. But get the benefits of fasting. And I heard you basically say the exact thing. And I was just like in their amen corner the whole time. Yeah, so yeah. Do, you, do you ever recommend fasting to someone who is already eating a carnivore diet? I don't. I, I don't think that it's necessary. You know, you're in that, you're in that metabolic state. So tons of studies showing the, the serious benefits of fasting, serious benefits of, of intermittent fasting. You know, you, you double your testosterone level for men. You can double your growth hormone, which is very good for, you know, aging and longevity and so forth. And, and fasting, long-term fasting and so forth. This, this has been shown repeatedly to have, have great effects, but it's, it's the metabolic state that you're in that provides the benefit as opposed to, you know, depriving yourself of calories from what I can see. And all of those studies that show benefit they also, you know, there's some that, that, you know, fasting mimicking diet is, is specific verbiage that different research groups have used because they, they look at the benefits of fasting. And one was specifically looking at reversing uh, type one and type two diabetes in mice. And so actually finding they could regrow beta islet cells in the pancreas of these mice, and they could start creating insulin again. And they found that Fasting as little as four days a month could confer this benefit and you know, the longer, the better. But they said, well, that's really hard. You know, fasting for four days is really hard. But if you go on a fasting mimicking diet, you have the exact same benefits, exact same. Okay. Yeah. So what is a fasting mimicking diet? That's keto. That's a keto diet. That's a carnivore diet. And the thing is, is what, you know, I've argued, you know, for years now is that the so-called fasting state is not a fasting state. That's our primary metabolic state. That's where all of our heavy machinery come to bear. That's the metabolic state of, of all, basically all animals in the wild as well. And this is where you know, all of our, our you know, heavy machinery come, you know, start getting used. We start making blood sugar. We start making glycogen. We start making ketones. We can access our fat stores. There are so many different processes that are benefited by this. They're completely shut down when you start eating carbohydrates and your insulin jacks up. And there's so many diseases like heart disease, which are, which implicate hyperinsulinemia as a main causative factor. So I totally agree with, with Charles Washington that basically the benefit of fasting, if you're eating, uh, you know, a, a standard, a standard American diet is that you have a break from eating poison. And you're just, you're just literally just giving yourself a break from eating awful things and, and specifically carbohydrates. This again, just fundamentally changes your metabolic state and it, it really harms you. And so just getting away from that is going to confer serious benefit. Now, when I meet somebody, even a carnivore who says, you know, man, I love fasting. It does great things for me. I'm like, okay, you know, 
cool. Yeah. I love eating. So yeah. <laughs> I really do. I just, I love sitting down to a plate of steak. I love to do that twice a day. And, yeah. and if you take that from me for even one to two days, it's not that I can't survive. People like carnivores should be able to, I, I would not die. Yeah. I might want to, but I would not die. <laughs> I just yeah. enjoy my food and I feel yeah. good eating that way. And so yeah. I, I don't there's, there's feel anything wrong with it. No. no, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. No, and and I I've been I mean look maybe there someone might come up with a study actually looking at, at fasting in in a carnivore or ketogenic uh, cohort and yeah. and maybe there is benefits to you know autophagy and so forth but you already get those yeah just just by eliminating carbs and when you're just eating what you're supposed to eat your body works so much better and yes you can get there by fasting yes you can get there by intermittent fasting to an extent it's not going to be as beneficial as eating the proper food yeah. and just living in that, in that biochemical state. And when you're eating what you're supposed to just fatty meat, your body knows how much it wants. And it will tell you when steak doesn't taste good, it means you're not hungry and you have to relearn your hunger signals. But when it does taste good, you are, and your, your body's asking for that. So I think you trust it. I don't think you have to deprive yourself of nutrition. Now people say, you know, that, that, you know, people just sort of automatically, intermittently fast. And, you know, I, I occasionally do as well. I, I tend to eat one large meal a day, but if I'm working out a lot, I'll probably, I'll probably have two, but let's say I'm just eating one. Well, that's technically intermittent fasting, yep. but it's not, I mean, it, it doesn't do anything for me in an intermittent fasting standpoint. It's just that when you eat high density nutrition, you're just not as hungry anymore yes. and you don't have to eat as much. And so, you know, I consider fasting, depriving yourself of food when you want to eat. And I don't, I don't do that. And I don't think that you need to do that. Yeah. I've, I typically eat twice per day. If I wake up really hungry, then I'll even eat a third time. I'll have breakfast. Most yeah. mornings I'm not hungry for breakfast, but I'm not fasting. I'm just not hungry. It would be yeah. silly to eat anytime. I'm not hungry. I'm actually a pretty big believer in not eating unless you're actually hungry and then stopping when you are comfortably satisfied. And for me, that looks like two meals per day, typically about two pounds of meat. If it's really high fat, then it's going to be a little mm. less than two pounds. If it's really lean, it's going to be more than two pounds, but yeah. that's about where I fall. Approximately what's a summary of what you do. Yeah. Very similar. I, okay. I yeah, quite high fat. Um, okay. so I'll get like ribeye steaks and like melt butter into them. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily track pounds i just yeah. i just sort of look at it and say oh, how much do i want so maybe I, I usually cut up steaks like into like you know sort of two two and a half pound steaks and then i'll, I'll melt butter into that and so and i'll just i'll just keep eating and I'll, I'll eat until i'm done if i'm eating you know two pounds three pounds whatever it's it's until i'm done and then um if i'm working out a lot i'll double that you know okay. like i haven't been in the gym in like three months but I, I still look like I go, you know, twice a day, every day. Yes, you and do. Um, that, that's what people tell me. And they're like, they just, yes. they literally don't believe me that I, that I have I've only been to the gym twice in three months. But when I do go regularly and I'm eating as much as, as my body wants, I'll, I'll put on, you know, one to two pounds every single time I, I work out. Wow. It's, a, it's a bit insane. Well, as, let me, what are you working with over there? Come on. Oh, there it is. Okay. I don't have that, but, <laughs> but I have started working a little bit more on it. I am. Hang on just a second. Hey, you okay, baby. I have a five-year-old with a stomach bug right now. No. And baby. also my Chawini apparently just pooped on the floor downstairs. So <laughs> <laughs> let me get a quick sip of water. Are you good to keep going? Yeah, of course. I drink seltzer water, by the way. You have any issues yeah. with seltzer water? Not really. I mean, it's just bubbles. Yeah, There's... that's good. Then we're still yeah. friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, macros. I know you typically eat 70 to 80% of your calories from fat. When you work with mm -hmm. your patients, is that about where you see people get the best results for both healing and for weight loss? Do you think that's kind of the sweet spot for most people? I, I think it is, yeah. And, and you know, a lot of people will maybe have different, different sort of fat requirements. And yeah. I, I tell them generally, it's a bit weird, but I tell them to go basically by the consistency of their stool. You know, if your stools are dry and hard, that means you're absorbing every ounce yeah. of fat and it's not getting into your stools to keep it soft. And so you should, you should eat more fat. Yeah. And it's a normal consistency. That means that you're eating 
all the fat that your body has bile for and a little more. And then that's going out and getting absorbed in, 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 your, in, in softening up the stool. And that's exactly where you want to be. That's the sweet spot. Or if you eat a lot more fat than your body can absorb, you're going to have you know, loose stools and things like that. And that's something that people see early on in carnivore, yeah. or they're still eating, um, uh, you know, using artificial sweeteners, which will absolutely do the same thing. Yeah. And they, they don't realize that that's actually a problem. So, you know, there is, um, you know, thing called, you know, protein poisoning, where if you get more than 40% of your total calories from protein, this can actually cause harm. And if you're not getting enough fat and you're not getting enough um, cholesterol, this is very bad for you in a lot of ways. Um, but you know, hormonally, it's a major problem. Cholesterol is, is the main precursor for all your major steroids and all your major hormones and, and your, especially your, your sex, sex hormones. And so, so women can you know, lose their cycle. They can you know, get hair loss and all these sorts of problems. Uh, by not eating enough fat and not getting enough cholesterol to make the you know, requisite amount of hormones that, that they need. Dude, I did that once. I, so I started what was a carnivore diet before I knew what it really was. My doctor just said, don't eat carbs. I was like, all yeah. right. So I lost 120 pounds basically on that advice. Don't eat yeah. carbs. And what he didn't say was also, if you don't eat carbs, you're going to need to eat a lot of fat. This was in 2004 to 2009 that yeah. I did not know if you don't eat carbs, you're gonna have to eat a lot of fat. Um, mm. I was very stubborn, so I stuck with it a long time. I did not have a cycle for two years, no period at all. Mm. Um, I was losing weight though, and I was very vain, so I stuck with that. <laughs> also at that point, I wasn't quite ready for children. So it was like, well, you know, that's okay. That's not that big of a deal. Oh my gosh, it is such a huge sign, of course, that something is wrong. Yeah. Um, mental fog, my hair was breaking, my skin was dried out. Yeah, I tell people, you will know if you are not getting enough fat. It's going to be a struggle to poop, yeah. exactly like you said. But rabbit starvation is a thing. But if you eat too much fat, it's just going to go right through. So it's yeah. really hard yeah. to overdo it the other way. Yeah. yeah. It's self-limiting, you know, yes. it's, it's, it's just going to be inconvenient as opposed to a uh, problem, you know, as opposed to uh, dangerous. You All know, right. So this it, is what, what kills me in regards to macros right now. Oh my gosh. I feel like every other carnivore podcast that I listen to now you're working with sick people. So I'm going to assume that this is so in the weeds for most of your patients, like who cares? And I mm -hmm. mostly feel that way too. A diabetic does not necessarily, especially if they're eating Twinkies, does not need to know exactly which percentage of fat to get. Just stop eating the sugar, right? Like that's, so getting in the weeds can be a little annoying, but it throws me off sometimes because I will listen to a brilliant couple of people on a podcast talk about how you need to prioritize protein, especially if you have weight to lose. And they will say more more calories from protein that you will start to lean up and these people look good right and you're like mm, okay maybe i'm team more protein and then you'll talk to people not unlike yourself who look good who also say you know what you really need to eat more fat and i know that more is also subjective because where are we starting from right more than a ribeye or are you like eating sticks of butter what are we calling more so for you it is typically ribeyes with butter mm. and do you think there's what do you think about the really high protein camp i know these people aren't dumb yeah <laughs> <laughs> um look I, I think i think you know you 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 hit the nail on the head you know it's about you know like you, you have a diabetic person you know just stop eating carbohydrates yes. that's going to do a lot of this work yes. you know it's not that that the protein or the fat is causing you to lose weight it's that not eating the carbs is causing you yeah. to lose weight and the the protein and the fat are just nourishing you people say that well if you don't eat fat then your body will use your own fat well, yeah. who, who told you that it wasn't going to use your fat if you you know you know didn't do that like it's going to use your fat anyway any meat is is good especially fatty meat because fatty meat will increase satiety and you'll eat less yes okay and just like in you know rabbit poisoning and so forth do you find that people that, that eat extremely lean, just don't eat any fat, they actually increase their hunger because there are vital nutrients and fat that you have to have. Yeah. And if you're only eating the protein, you're, you, you'll go a little crazy and you'll just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. So these people are actually overeating yeah. 
Yeah. But they're not getting the nutrients that they need and then they die eventually. Yeah. You know, you can, you can get you can get very, very harmed if you're eating, you know, zero fat. Um, so I think that these people, you know, who just say eat a whole bunch of protein, are probably going to lose the fat anyway, or lose, lose weight anyway, yeah. but they could do it in a healthier way. You know, the fat actually is healthy for you. If that does not make you fat, right. you know, fat makes you lean, strong and healthy. It is one of the most important things that you can have in your diet as, as evidenced by the fact that most animals in the wild get about 70, 80% of their, their calories from fat carnivores and herbivores carnivores because they eat animals with the fat and they go for the fat first herbivores also because this is what they break down cellulose into they break it down into short chain fatty acids and that's what they absorb they don't absorb the carbohydrates they absorb the short chain fatty acids gorillas that just eat green leaves they get about 70 percent of their calories from saturated fat cows that eat grass they get upwards of 80 percent because they're more efficient at it so this is all 70 to 80 percent primates um the higher proportion of calories from fat that a, that a primate gets it is a direct correlation to the size of their brain. You know, I've talked to Dr. Baker about this as well, and he's found that you know he's slimmed down when he's e eating less fat and so forth. But just like you say, you know, when you're eating lean meat, you have to eat more pounds of yes. meat, and so you know there are just simply less calories in in protein versus fat, and they're utilized differently in your body as well. So it could be just as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, there's just a recent study that that Dr. Baker talked about as well that. Um, cholesterol intake is, is, is directly related to muscle growth. You, you increase your cholesterol, you increase your muscle growth from, from exercise. So fat is actually important yeah. for being, for lean muscle mass as well. But also, you know, I just listen to my body, you know, I'm not, I'm not dogmatic about it. I'm not saying I have to have this, but I, again, just look at how I feel, what tastes good and you know, how, how my stools are doing. If I'm, if I'm drying hard, if I'm running or whatever, I, I just, I just modulate a little bit. So when I'm working with somebody and they're saying, look, I'm doing carnivore, it's been a few months, I'm not getting quite the results that I want. You know, I'll say, look, I don't know what you're eating right now. Even if you were to tell me ribeyes, I'm not seeing the ribeye you're eating. You know, every steak varies so much. I don't know how much fat you're getting. So mm -hmm. I'll typically say, look, if you think you're eating really high fat, maybe try going just a little leaner for a while. If you think you're eating leaner, Try go and when I say leaner, I always say I am not talking some dry chicken breast. I mean, yeah. like maybe try a few sirloins a week, see if that does anything. If it does nothing for you, go right back to what you're doing. If you are already eating a lot of London broil or more lean steaks, try upping fat because I've seen people get better results going either way. Yeah. But also, if you don't know exactly where somebody is on the spectrum to start with, it's hard to say were you really lean or high fat to begin with? So, you know, I, I feel like once you have gotten off of carbs, that self-experimentation can be like kind of fun, you know? <laughs> like, let's yeah. see, do I bulk up a little more like in a good lean mass kind of way when I'm eating lean or protein? You can find that out. Hey, I can see you a little better there. I like that, it's yeah. good. <laughs> but speaking of weight loss, I know that you are frequently, as a doctor, you are mostly trying to just heal things. And that's really where my passion is too. But you know good and well that a lot of people who come to carnivore maybe weren't even really feeling that sick. They just are sick of being overweight or obese. Yeah. Do you ever see anybody who cannot lose weight even on carnivore? I have yet to see someone who's gone pure, 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 just meat and water and not have you know dramatic results right away. I'm sure they exist. I'm sure there are exceptions. There's exception to every rule. Yeah. Um, and I've certainly heard about these things, people that are very big proponents um, you know, on, on Facebook groups, like, you know, zeroing in on health or zero carb health and so forth. There's some of these people that are long stay carnivores. They're like, you know, it took me 18 months yeah. before something happened yep. and, and that's, and that's fine. So, so maybe there's something going on there, but with the ones I've seen personally that have had difficulty, um, generally or like every single time I should say are eating things that aren't pure carnivore. And then when they just really just drop it, uh, then that goes back. But that's why I tell people that the last 5% of going pure carnivore generally gives about 95% of the benefit. It really yeah. is a big jump. It's a big jump, just yeah. dropping the last little bits of that. Oh, I found that to be completely true for myself. I have heard some people say you can't gain weight on only meat and water though. Hmm. And I personally, when I went all in carnivore as in, okay, I will not restrict calories. I'm not going to do this low fat version anymore. I'm just going to eat fatty meat. I slowly gained weight for six months. And, and I tell you this, 
zero seasoning, not even salt, mm -hmm. zero coffee, zero anything except for beef, only beef and mm -hmm. only water. Because I was like, what am I doing wrong? I must get strict and stricter, strict. six months. And I gained about 23 pounds. Oh. And it's like, that can't be having people like, yeah, it was muscle. No, it wasn't. It wasn't muscle. I wasn't like ripped. I, I was not muscle. Yeah. <laughs> but I tell people, do not let that scare you because at the end of that six months, I kept doing what I was doing. I did not suddenly like, okay, well, I give up. That weight did start to come off. And what I think happens is sometimes people have restricted calories and eaten so mm. low fat, so low calorie that then when they do go all in carnivore and they go from, you know, 1200 calories to 2200 calories, there's going to be yeah. an adjustment period. So I know yeah. it can be done, but I think so often people quit while their body is still adjusting and it might take six months. It could take a year. My gosh, for most of us, you know, it took 40 years of crappy eating or so before most people even yeah. start. So yeah, I, I do see it sometimes. And of course, I'm not with these people every day. I can't say for sure what they're eating, but I know for sure what I was eating. I yeah, know yeah. it's possible, but I also know that sometimes there's a benefit, like there can be a reason. That, by the way, was when I did get my cycle back. Two years without it, oh, remember? Yeah. Great. And then, yeah. you know, it came back. Like my body was dealing with that. So 23 pounds came, 23 pounds went back off, and I haven't had to worry about it since. It's not like now, yeah. oh gosh, up and down 23 pounds. That was it. It's just, yeah. yeah. So I don't yeah. know. I, I get why people get frustrated though. I panicked for six months straight because yeah. you can't gain weight on beef and water. Yeah. <laughs> but I was. But again, yeah. if somebody is experiencing that right now, I just try to tell people, if you're getting any benefits at all, and I've never met anybody who has said for six months, they didn't feel any benefits at all. Literally nobody. Yeah. I say, if you're feeling something, even if your weight isn't doing exactly what you want it to do, like hang in, you know, there's things people can tweak like macros. We were talking about, you can tweak your sleep. You can tweak circadian rhythms, but overall, I feel like just hang in, man. It's going to get better. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, there, there's, there's definitely something going on there. And I think it, it was very likely that when you're starving yourself and depriving yourself of, of yes. nutrients, your body uh, then says, no, 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 we need this now. And also, you know, when, when you're, yeah, when you're deprived or you're deprived nutritionally just from eating the wrong things and so forth, you're going, you're going to gain some sort of weight because you're going to just, you're just going to, your, your tissues, you're going to grow healthy tissue. And that might be muscle mass, but you know, other tissue as well, it's just going to yeah. get more uh, you know, thick and robust. And, you know, if you eat less than 1200 calories a day, this is, it's quite known that your, your body now turns into a, like a, a preservation mode yes. and it tries to really, really preserve all the calories that come in and it doesn't want you to burn them. So it's not like it's, it's actually uh, necessarily as beneficial for weight loss. If you're eating, if you're just starving yourself. Right. You know? That's and how those so, calories in, calories out people who act like humans mm -hmm. are math problems. I'm like, dude, they say you lost weight, not because you cut out carbs, because you eat less calories. I'm like, are you kidding? I was so low calorie before, way down here. And yeah. I would cry because I thought I cannot eat any less. I can't eat any less. And now I'm full all day on meat. It's not a math yeah. problem. It's not that calories yeah. are meaningless, but no, no, it's no, not no. a simple math problem. No, it's not. And people say, oh, yeah, just calories in, calories out. That is very simplistic. Yes. And, you know, for, for doctors to say that, doctors who have taken biochemistry and understand the complexities of organic, uh, organic chem molecules in your body, you know, that, that, that means you're really not thinking this one through. Yes. It's very complex uh, processes in your body. Um, and so you, should, you, know, you should treat them with due respect. You know, it's, it's a complex uh, mechanistic uh, action for each one of these things. Yeah. And people who have a massive calorie deficit, the worst thing they could do is to keep lowering it if they aren't losing weight. Like that's why right. you've slowed everything down so dramatically. And I see so many people like, I'm going to need you to eat more for a while. And they're like, yeah, but I'm not yeah. losing weight. Yeah, I know. I know you're yeah. starving sister. You are starving. Yeah. yeah, I see it. Okay. Sometimes I've heard you talk about somebody who's mostly carnivore. You said that a little bit ago that they might be keeping sweeteners or maybe they're having seed oils with things, vegetable oils, like mayonnaise once in a while, um, coffee, a lot of dairy. If somebody tells you they're like a lenient carnivore, what's yeah. the number one thing out of that that kind of worries you? Like, oh no, I hope they aren't still having 
The main ones are sugar and carbohydrates that yes. I try to get rid of alcohol, obviously. Yes. And, um, and, uh, and then, and then artificial sweeteners and polyunsaturated fats and so forth. Nightshades generally, generally people that keep a little bit of stuff in yeah it's often artificial sweeteners and stevia yes. and, and things like that if i had to pick one of those things that i was going to have it like chicken wings cooked in kind of a crappy oil or something or fruit i personally because i am a recovered sugar addict Mm. And because I have heard you talk a lot about um, Dr. Lustig in the benefits yeah. of just removing fructose. And we yeah. know what fructose does when it comes to gout. We know what fructose does for teeth, what it does for diabetes, fructose yeah. itself. Man, yeah. but especially somebody who is a recovering sugar addict. I'd be like, well, I'll eat chicken wings today, but I personally would not add it. And people who keep harping on this, honey and fruit thing. I'm like, I don't know, man. Is that even carnivore? It is not to me. Obviously people can call carnivore, whatever they want to, yeah. but it would not work for me because it's full of fructose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I'd eat the chicken wings as well. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch fruit. No, yeah. I mean, sugar is a drug. I mean, yes. you know, Dr. Lustig, I mean, showed that conclusively and we know that it also, that fructose also is metabolizing the same byproducts as alcohol in our liver. And so we get the same diseases from those byproducts uh, from fructose as we do from alcohol because they're exactly the same. And so you're killing your brain like meth yeah. and you're killing your body like alcohol. Like this is one of the worst drugs known to man. And sure, you know, fruit isn't going to have as much fructose in it as fruit juice oh. or Coca-Cola yeah. or something like that, right. but it has enough. I'm like, how much, how much, uh, you know, do you think is good for you? I don't think anything is good for you. And we also know Lustig is you know, said many times, you know, that, that there are no biochemical processes in the body that require fructose, none at all. It's a completely, un, you know, non-essential uh, nutrient. It can be used as calories, yeah. but it doesn't need to be. And there are no biochemical processes that require it. And so the argument that your thyroid is going to, you know, uh, knock off if you don't have fructose or, or something else is, well, no, because there are no biochemical processes that require fructose, including in your thyroid. Okay. So yes. you don't need it. I think that people that are pushing, uh, you know, fruit and, and sugar and honey and things like that, I think that there's something else going on and, you know, they're not really necessarily, and they're, they're attributing it to, um, you know, lack of fructose, but there's no such thing as fructose deficiency. No. Just, thing. And so, um, I think they're attributing it to that when there's actually something else going on. A lot of these people are, are push, um, you know, the, the incorporation of organs, especially liver, say liver, 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 eat a lot of liver and they, you know, promote liver supplements and so forth. Yep. So, you know, um, you know, that's fine. You're nutri nutritionally deficient or you're, you're eating you know, a very poor diet, Liver's your best friend, you know, it's, it's yeah. very nutrient dense, but therein also lies the problem because it can be too much. And, you know, we know you can get, uh, you know, hypervitaminosis A among other things. And we also know that hypervitaminosis A reduces your uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, which yeah. is going to reduce the, the, uh, the output and production of your thyroid. I've been carnivore longer than these people. You've yeah. been carnivore longer than these people. I don't think either of us have eaten fruit in no. a decade. No. And so, you know, and our thyroids are fine. Also, um, you know, again, what about the Inuits? There's no fruit or honey in the North Pole, just isn't. There's no fruit or honey during the ice ages. There just wasn't. And so, you know, again, you can't live generationally if you're in fructose deficiency and right. you're not getting fructose. And, you know, yeah. talking about liver, I did not eat liver for my first 11 years of carnivore. Mm -hmm. I, I do not like it. I didn't grow up eating it. I never sought it out. I was perfectly fine. But, you know, around year 11, you hear enough people say, nose the tail, nose the tail. Yeah. You're like, okay, I will give this a shot. So I did a, a month long experiment. It was not wise. I do not recommend. But <laughs> I ate a very small, not like pounds of liver, but a small amount of liver every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, by the end of the month, I felt the worst as a carnivore that I'd ever felt. I originally mm -hmm. thought I was getting a cold. It was histamine-ish. Like, my gosh, what is wrong with me? 
by the end of the month, I'm snotting and blowing. I'm like, okay, it's been yeah. a month. This cannot be a cold at this point. It's got to be the liver. So I stopped and it just went away. So I do know some people say, man, liver, it's, it's so good for you. It is nutrient dense. And if someone loves the taste of it, it's possible their body does yeah. need something. I'm not against yeah. liver. I also, I don't think any part of an animal should be like, feared if it tastes good to you and it makes you feel good cool but as far as like the liver pushers as in whether you're craving it or not whether it tastes good or not whether it makes you feel good or not you need the liver no you don't go home with that no you don't yeah in 10 years of being carnivore i've i've literally made i maybe eaten liver four or five times maybe five i don't even think it's five but if you're already eating nutrient dense uh, steaks and so forth, like you, you just, you just don't need it. And, you know, um, uh, you know, professor Stefanson, who was a, you know, uh, wrote the book, uh, you know, fat of the land. Know. Yeah. You know, so he was a, he was a, for people who don't know, he was a Harvard professor of ethnology. He was a polar explorer. He lived with the Inuits for years and years and years, discovered actually quite a lot of, uh, of, of Northern Canada and, uh, and so forth up towards the North pole. And he lived with these guys and he, and he ate the way they ate. They did not eat the organs. They fed those to the dogs. They ate the skeletal muscle and the fat. And so, and everyone, even then, like I saw an interview with him, like in the fifties, they're like, well, don't you have to eat, you know, the, all the organs, that's where you get the nutrients from. He's like, no, you don't have to do that. That's a myth. Yes. You do not have to do that. And he was, he was all over that, you know, right away. Um, you know, Dr. Salisbury, J.H. Salisbury from the Salisbury Steak, what that's named off, off of, he did a 30-year 30 um, 30 research project in the 1800s looking at the optimal uh, nutrition for human beings. He found that he could reverse diseases such as, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, tuberculosis, gout, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and so forth, 100 years before he had any effective treatments for these things. And he could cure them by putting the people on a, a pure red meat and water diet, wrote a book called The Relation of Alimentation and Disease, you know, alimentation meaning our digestion. Yeah. So saying the relationship between what we eat and the diseases, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book of the exact same nature, basically arguing that the so-called chronic diseases that we treat nowadays are not diseases per se, but toxicities and malnutrition, yeah. toxic buildup of species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition, namely too many plants, not enough meat. You know, Salisbury wrote this book 150 years ago now. Yeah. Exactly the same premise. You know, it's just, it's just like this food causes these diseases. You don't eat the food, you don't get the diseases. If you have the diseases, stop eating the food, they go away. It's that simple. I, I just I just boiled down my entire book in that in that sentence. And his book too, you know, you just don't eat this. But he wasn't saying eat organs. He was yeah. saying eat skeletal muscle. Certainly not recommended that to my patients. I've told them if you want to eat the organs, yeah. go for it, but you don't have to. Right. And so if it tastes good and you enjoy it, go for it. Yeah. But you know, don't just go out of your way and remember the proportionality of a cow to for its, you know, its yes. muscle mass to it to its liver. So my patients have never run into this. My long-term uh, carnivore friends and patients and so forth haven't ever run into to thyroid issues. I don't have thyroid issues. They correct their thyroid issues. They don't get thyroid issues. Just look at you know yourself and Charles Washington. He's been doing this for 14 years. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't have any you know, thyroid issues. He's no. not having the problems that they're having. And so you, you have to look at that and recognize and go, okay, well, well, maybe it's something else. Let's do a little more rapid fire. Do you use salt? Yes. Salt to taste is fine. Salt to taste. Same. Yeah. Um, do you eat any chicken or pork? I do, but rarely 99% okay. of what I eat would be beef. If someone were serving chicken or pork, would that bother you? Or would you just eat it no. if you were at your no, mama's house it. yeah yeah same. No, i definitely eat it I'd i'm go not for the scared of those yeah. poofas <laughs> no, no it's no. chicken it's pork it's an animal it's delicious yeah. do you eat yeah. any fish uh, yeah yeah same same sort of principle like okay. every now and then i'll be going through costco and just look at the salmon yeah. and be like no it looks good i'll just grab that yeah. Yeah. so you don't have like a hard rule like i have to eat it a couple times per week but just once in a while you're like yeah. you know what that sounds like a nice variety yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll eat any sort of animal that you can, that you can get at the store. You know, my, my rule would be like, you know, anything that moves and had a face. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you use seasonings other than salt? No, no, no not even pepper. No, no, no. Just okay. victory. And yeah. Did you say just victory? 
but <laughs> no, it's just a joke. I'm just say like, oh, you know. I was like, what is this new seasoning? Victory, Victory and how yeah. do I get it? What is your promo code? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, if, if your steak does require a lot of seasoning in order to taste good, you just aren't hungry enough because you alluded to this before. Hunger is the best sauce. People who yeah. tell me, oh, I have to have a lot of ketchup. You're probably overcooking your steak, first of all. And but secondly, it, 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 you're not hungry. You're and not also, hungry. if you're putting ketchup on a steak, you should be shot. I mean, yes. That's just, that's... What are you doing with that? I used no. to use a lot of A1 sauce growing up. I mean, I wasn't no. a carnivore. I was actually a really heavy set kid with problems, but my parents overcooked every single steak. So of yeah. course it needed some A1 sauce. It was horrible. Yeah. Well, well that's what I was going to say. You know, if you, you're putting sauce on these things, it's probably because the meat's not very good quality. You, yes. You've overdone it or, or done something else. Have you worked with many postmenopausal women with carnivore? I do get some women who say, should I do things any differently after menopause? <laughs> Just keep, just keep doing it. I have heard, um, Dana Spencer, she is one of the other first carnivores I met. She's a 14 year carnivore. And she found, um, that during menopause, her needs changed just a little bit macro wise. And after menopause, in order to maintain her same weight as before, she needed um, just a little bit less fat. She said, don't okay. get me wrong. I'm still eating what most people would consider a perfectly fatty meat diet, but instead of straight up ribeyes, she has fish a little more often in order for her to keep the physique that she was used to. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes I've heard postmenopausal women say, you know, they tend to gain eating the same things that they used to eat before. That's typically for carb eaters, not carnivores. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know if you, I don't have a lot of experience, you know, with working with that. Yeah. Well, I, th I think you just still listen to your body and, yeah. you know, like, you know, Dana listened to hers and that's how she felt uh, that she was feeling better and, li and liked it better. And, and so she just naturally adjusted. It's not to say that your body won't adjust its, its requirements. Right. It's that you don't have to change your approach. You know, you can still just, just see how your body's being affected, see what you're hungry for, see what tastes good, you know, what your stools are doing and so forth. And as long as you're doing that, uh, I think if you, if you know how to listen to your body and you, and you uh, can, can watch for the signs, then you can, you can figure out what your body wants, regardless of your stage in life. She had to cut back a little on dairy, which I forgot to ask you, do you personally use dairy at all? Um, I, I don't have a problem with dairy okay. personally, but a lot of people do. Yes. And, and there is enough lactose in things like milk that uh, they can, it can cause an insulin spike, which I don't want. And so I do tend to avoid it. Meat is always the meal to me. And so again, 99% of what I eat is beef. The other 0.9% are other meats. And then there's like very, very rarely I'll have some, some milk or some cheese on meat, but you know, I won't, I won't just, you know, uh, drink a bunch of milk or just eat a bunch of cheese. My skin breaks out. If I have much dairy, I can't do it much. I'm currently doing no, no. dairy March with my yeah. friends, Karen yeah. and Jackie and a few others have joined me just cause we know we, we need a break from it. Now that said, yeah. you know, if I'm going out to eat and there's a charcuterie board or something, you know, and I'm yeah. going to have some meat with some cheese, special occasion, I, I can deal with it. It's not like I have a deathly allergy, but I really do have to limit it. And, and a lot of people I see who are such, who are so um, adamant that in order to lose weight as a carnivore, you have to do all this fasting. It no. does seem that a lot of them are also having a lot of dairy. And I'm like, yes, if I was eating that much dairy, I would need 24 hours to take off from my diet too. It's yeah, a lot true. of dairy and I can't handle it. You know, some people do fine with it, but I can't. Yeah. 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 No, I, I avoid it as well. And you're getting this insulin response and, and, you know, insulin stores fat and it doesn't allow you to use fat. And so it's, uh, it's something to watch out for. And so I, 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 you know, severely limit my, my dairy, but I don't exclude it personally, but someone who has like autoimmune issues, I would definitely say exclude it. Yes. It can be so inflammatory for some people. Yeah. I usually eat much more dairy in the winter because it's sweater weather, baby, who cares? But in the summertime, like I am not having cheese. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. You can't do it just the same way. Yeah. Dude, you're awesome. I am no, so yes. <laughs> excited that you are out here just preaching it, walking the walk, talking it. You're with your patients. You're writing a book. I cannot wait to like tell everybody when it does come out it means a lot that you took this long i know that was uh that was a pretty no, solid talk no, there but, well thank you dr chafee for coming on and uh i look forward to reading your book and seeing you on many more podcasts 
Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Thanks.